Why is an ideal gas known as an ideal gas? What's so ideal about it? Let's take a look at that. If you enjoy this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. Okay, so first things first. An ideal gas is a concept in physics that allows us to study the behavior of real gases to very high degrees of accuracy without having to study all the intricate details of a real gas. Before we look at the differences between the ideal gas concept and a real gas, it's worth me mentioning here that we'll only be studying the classical ideal gas and we won't be looking at any of the quantum ones. We might be familiar with the idea that a gas is made up of lots of little particles that can move around fairly freely. And we might also be familiar with the idea that a gas can expand to fill its container. Now this ideal gas model, this model that physicists have created, is also made up of lots of little particles, but these particles are all little hard spheres. In other words, this ideal gas model assumes that every single particle is a perfect little sphere and that each of these spheres is identical to each other in every way. It also assumes that if there are any collisions between, say, two particles, or between a particle and the wall of the container that the gas is in, that these collisions are all elastic. In other words, no energy is lost in these collisions. That means that there's no deformation of the two particles when they collide, they just perfectly bounce off each other, and there's also no conversion of energy to any other kind except for kinetic energy. In a real gas, the assumptions that we've just talked about don't necessarily work. For example, a real gas could be made up of individual atoms, or it could be made up of molecules as well. If the gas that we're talking about is made up of molecules, like carbon dioxide, for example, then obviously each gas particle is not a little hard sphere. But even in the case where we talk about a gas made up of single atoms, they're still not hard spheres, especially if we start thinking about the quantum mechanical model of the atom, but we won't go into that too much here. The point is though that an ideal gas, the model that physicists use, assumes that these particles are very, very tiny and they're perfectly spherical, and also that they bounce off each other in an elastic way without losing any energy. Whereas we've seen that for a real gas, those assumptions don't necessarily hold true. Another assumption made by the ideal gas model is that the particles are so spread out that the average distance between particles is much, much bigger than the size of a particular particle itself. Another way to look at this is that the density of the gas is very low. There are very few particles for any region of space that we want to consider, and therefore the average distance between particles is much bigger than the size of a particle by itself. In fact, for an ideal gas, we can even treat every single particle as being infinitely small. At this point, the distance between particles is definitely bigger than the size of one particle. For a real gas, this assumption that the average distance between particles is much bigger than the size of one particle can be a fairly reasonable one. Like I mentioned, if the density of the gas is really low, then this can work quite well. But if the density of the gas were to increase for whatever reason, like it could if the gas is close to turning into a liquid, for example, then this assumption becomes worse and worse. Let's look at one more ideal gas assumption. This one says that there are no intermolecular forces. In other words, no forces of attraction or repulsion between particles. The only forces that particles exert on each other occur when they collide with each other and bounce off. But we know that this is not true for real gases. Let's think about a gas that's made up of individual atoms. We know that atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and protons and electrons are charged particles. Now, if electrons are found surrounding the nucleus, which contains the other two kinds of particles, then when two atoms come close together in this gas, there's going to be some sort of electrostatic force between them without them necessarily colliding with each other. In the case that we've drawn here, the electrons in the two atoms are repelling each other. And so it's not true that the only force occurs when the particles bounce off each other. However, here's the point. The force that we've shown acting here is actually quite weak. And this is where the ideal gas model comes into its own. All of the assumptions we make in this ideal gas model are oversimplifications of a real gas, but many real gases come close to behaving like an ideal one. And the closer they get to behaving like an ideal gas, in terms of closely matching the assumptions we make, the better our ideal gas model works for the real gas. What we mean by this is that the predictions made by our theoretical ideal gas model very closely reflect how the real gas actually ends up behaving. A good example of this is helium. Helium as a gas is made up of individual atoms. These atoms have very weak interatomic forces, so our assumption that there are no forces between our particles 
is pretty close to being true. The average size of a helium atom is very small compared to the size of other atoms or even other molecules that make up other gases. And so our assumption that the average distance between particles is much, much bigger than the size of a particular particle is very reasonable without having to go to very, very low densities of helium gas. Even at room temperature and pressure, helium's density is generally low enough that we can treat this assumption as being highly accurate. So what we're seeing here is sort of a set of sliding scales. The closer each scale gets to our ideal gas assumption, the better the ideal gas model is for representing our real gas. And in fact, for gases like helium, we see a very minuscule difference between the ideal behavior and the real gas behavior. This means that we don't always have to deal with the intricacies of all of the real gases behavior. We can make massive simplifications and still get a very good model that represents closely how a real gas should behave. There are, of course, other very important assumptions made by the ideal gas model, but I just wanted to take a look at a few of them and compare between a real gas and an ideal gas. And it turns out we can make the ideal gas model a bit more complicated if necessary. For example, the ideal gas model, as we've already seen, assumes that each particle is a tiny hard sphere. This way, we don't have to deal with any energy being stored in this gas in the form of rotation of these particles. The only energy stored in this gas is due to the movement of each of these particles, linear kinetic energy. Because it doesn't really mean anything for an object that we assume to be infinitely small to rotate. There's no way to store energy in that kind of rotation. However, a real gas may store some energy in the form of rotation of its molecules. For example, a diatomic gas, a gas containing particles that are made up of two atoms, can have energy stored in its molecules due to their rotation. In that case, we can change our basic model to include particles made up of very simplified diatoms. Then we can look at the energy that would be stored due to the rotation of each one of these particles. And another example is when the density of a gas increases, our assumption that the distance between each one of these particles is large no longer applies. As a result, the forces acting between these particles become more and more important, and we can no longer just ignore them. In this particular case, we take all our ideal gas models mathematics and replace it with a van der Waals gas. And I'd love to make a video on the van der Waals gas equation in the future and talk through the modifications that this makes compared to the ideal gas model. Let me know if you'd like to see that. And with all of that being said, I'm going to finish up here. Check out the description below for a link to my merch. It's a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. And if you like this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Hit that bell button if you'd like to be notified when I upload. A huge thank you to my Giga patrons and to all of my other patrons as well. Link to my Patreon again in the description below if you want to support me on there. Thank you so much as always for watching. I really appreciate it and I'll see you very soon.